this is Tim Congdon, Chair of the Institute of International Monetary Research at the University of Buckingham. Um, it's August uh, 2023, uh, and the Institute um, has now been in existence for, for almost uh, 10 years. It was set up in early 2014. The, the main aim of the Institute has been to follow the behaviour of the quantity of money in various countries and to use this information uh, to make analyses and forecasts of what would then happen to economies. It's been a very interesting decade. Uh, what I'd like to do today is to see whether our approach makes sense given the latest data. When we got started back in the mid-2010s, uh, the uh, homepage of the website included a chart of the growth rates of money uh, in the G20 countries, showing that there was a relationship between them, between the growth rates of money and the growth rates of non nominal GDP. We showed that this relationship held for all of the G20 countries. That was a key item of evidence that money is relevant to the determination of national income. And what I want to do today is to just re rehearse the... We didn't update this chart during the COVID-19 period because there were such erratic movements in money uh, in 2020 and 2021. Of course, these movements are very important for inflation, but um, we're getting to, a, I hope, a more stable period. So here is uh, the table. It shows the compound annual growth rates of money and nominal GDP for the G20 countries for the years at 1980 to 2022. Now just, there are some problems. Um, the euro didn't come into existence until 1999. So the data here refer, refers, as far as Eurozone is concerned, to uh, um, 1995 to 2022. Uh, the Eurozone is in there because the European Union is one of the members of the G20. It's a member over and above um, the countries, Germany, France, Italy. Um, and such places as, as Russia, of course, had dramatic upheavals with the end of communism uh, in 1991 and 1992. So um, um, there the data start um, in 1995. But basically the story is of these uh, 20 different uh, countries, geopolitical entities, over a long period of time, <clears throat> all with their own institutions, all their own arrangements, and the growth rates of money and nominal GDP. And the key issue is, are they related? Um, and I just say here before I move on that um, the sources of the data are very, very reliable. That the International Monetary Fund have done some cross-checking with the OECD data database. Um, I've been helped by my colleague John Petley. The data are very, very reliable, very strong. Here's the chart. And um, yes, the relationship is extremely close. You know, you can see the countries that have got low growth rates of money have low growth rates for normal GDP. There's a group in the middle. And then there's Latin American countries with very high growth rates of money, very high growth rates, normal GDP. Um, I think that's, uh, um, it's obvious in graphical terms. Let's then do an equation. Uh, I know you're not all econometricians, and neither am I really, but um, I know there are some things that matter when we do these equations. Uh, we have an absolutely fantastic equation. We have this fantastic equation, even though all these countries are so quite separate, the different institutions and so on and so forth. Still, what we have is a R squared for this equation of um, over 0.99. One is, 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 is perfection, but a 0.99. We have a, a, a coefficient um, in the equation itself of 0.96. Not exactly one, but um, not far off. And the... <clears throat> this is rather highfalutin econometrics for many, many people, but 
we also want to know just how useful that coefficient is, how useful this equation is uh, in forecasting uh, um, how, if we want to make estimates of, of how precisely uh, nominal GDP will respond if we change the rate of growth of money. And to do that, it has to be called the T-statistic uh, measure of significance, the reliability um, of the coefficient. Uh, the minimum acceptable level is 2. The value in this equation is almost 60. Uh, this is a very, very good equation. Um, let me concede that the relationship is not, again, the long word, monotonic. Um, it isn't when the rate of growth of money rises, then automatically the next country that rate of growth of GDP rises. In fact, you have, say, for USA and Canada, Canada had a uh, um, slightly um, higher growth rate of money, but a somewhat lower growth rate of nominal GDP. And we had similar issues when we compared the UK and Saudi Arabia uh, and South Africa with South Korea. But in none of these cases was the departure from the relationship that dramatic. We certainly had, for the uh, country with the lowest growth rate of money, that's Japan, also the lowest growth rate of nominal GDP. I think the growth of money was, was it, was it 4% nominal GDP was, was um, I think, 1.8 or something. And we also had, for the country with the highest growth rate of money, the highest growth rate of nominal GDP, which is Argentina. The uh, compound annual growth rate of money over that 42-year period was 73.6%, uh, uh, and the increase in nominal GDP was, I think, um, was it 72.5%, something like that. Anyway, uh, growth rates of money, nominal GDP, 73, 72%, very, very close. Now, talking about Argentina, I'm going to be perhaps a bit um, polemical in what I'm about to say, but some things are important. Um, one of the members of the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee uh, in the last six years has been a lady from Argentina called Silvana Tenreiro. Um, she originally went to Tucumán University in Argentina. She took a doctorate at Harvard and she teaches at London School of Economics in addition to her work on the Bank of England. Now, early this year, as we come to the end of her term, she made a statement which I regarded then and still regard as absolutely fantastic. She said, quantitative easing affects the economy only to the extent it affects interest rates. There is no separate money channel that can unleash inflation. I've just told you the growth rates of money and nominal GDP in Argentina in the 42 years to 2022. And then we get this statement from an economist who comes from Argentina. Where Tenreiro is coming from is what's currently fashionable in macroeconomics, academic macroeconomics, um, which is this idea of interest rate only, New Keynesian macro, focusing on three equations, none of which include the quantity of money. Uh, I won't go into any more detail on this at the moment, but this is the domin dominant, currently fashionable view in central banks. Hugh Pill at the Bank of England, chief economist, Bank has, has described this set of ideas as iconic. In my view, it is this set of ideas that is largely to blame, in fact, is the key source, intellectual source, of the mistakes in central bank policy in the last few years. I'm now going to give you my thoughts about this subject. Um, so I'm somewhat less pleasing, mug shot about to appear, but um, the effect of QE, quantitative easing, um, just think about, first of all, how, what that, actually, that phrase really means. It means that when the state, either the government or the central bank, usually it's the central bank, when they buy um, assets from us, from the non-bank private sector, our bank deposits go up, 
and bank deposits and money. So there's, in that first round effect, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the central bank asset purchases and the quantity of money. Secondly, when the quantity of money rises, that affects the equilibrium value of everything else in the economy. It affects the equilibrium value of national income and expenditure. <laughs> That's why we had that link. Send 3% to 2% in Argentina, all right? A uh, very low growth rate in Japan of money. Very low growth rate of normal GDP, risks of deflation. But it then works in other ways as well. It works certainly through the price of bonds. It's what Keynes explained in the general theory. So when the quantity of money goes up, the initial effect on the price of bonds is to raise the price of bonds, which reduces bond yields. That's what happened to some extent in 2020. But it also affects the price of houses, the price of corporate equity, including the price of quoted corporate equity. So you tend to get this link between surges in the quantity of money and surges in the stock market, which are certainly very obvious in 2020 and 2021. Uh, and some of the videos that I made then were about that topic. The change in the price of houses, the change in the stock market, then affects spending. That too is one of the reasons why there's this link between money and normal GDP, the link that holds in all G20 countries over a 40-year period, please, Professor Tenreiro. Although there is, let's just make this clear, a problem in one country in this discussion, which is Argentina. In Argentina, the inflation rate is very high, it's very volatile, and it's very unpredictable. So there is no bond market in Argentina. There is no bond yield in Argentina that's at all meaningful. There is no interest rate in that sense in Argentina. So very far from the interest rate channel being the only one that works, there isn't such a thing in Argentina. So let's just get this clear that um, this is a robust relationship between the change in the quantity of money and the change in normal GDP. It applies everywhere. It's an always and everywhere theory. And this is really why I set up the Institute almost a decade ago. Um, you know, uh, just, just, you know, I've got these various things that are in the homepage of the website. Um, and I'm sorry if I've just seemed a little bit angry, but, but you know, <laughs> some things are very important and these things do matter. Normally in these videos, I think about um, not this sort of very large topic of why we do this work at all, but actually I give uh, comments on current monetary trends and I make forecasts of the next year or two, maybe next two or three years, using those money date, that money data. Now, what I want to say on that front at the moment is that in the main Western countries, you have two very powerful forces tending to keep money growth down. One is that the regulators want to make the banks safe. They don't understand when they make the banks safe, they tend to cause the banks to grow slowly or perhaps even to shrink their balance sheets. And this then is a major negative for the growth of money. The present in the USA, the Eurozone, the UK, some other countries, um, the regulators are trying to get banks to have even higher capital asset ratios than at present under the Basel IV rules instead of the Basel III rules, which came in uh, from autumn 2008 through to 2010. Banks reacted actually from autumn 2008. But, um, the second key influence here is that the um, in the quantitative easing period, both the quantitative easing in the Great Recession and afterwards, and the QE that took place in 2021 and to some extent 2022 in the COVID period, um, the central banks built up, built up huge asset piles. In the last 18 months or so, bond yields have soared. The value of these asset piles has gone down. It's embarrassing the central banks. The central banks want to reduce these asset piles. Now, it's just the opposite of QE. When the central bank uh, um, sells me or any other uh, non-bank private sector, sells me something, 
Um, I have to pay for it with my bank deposits, which leave my bank account, the quantity of money falls. So you've therefore got the move to Basel IV and the central bank sales of assets tending to keep money growth down, and these are deflationary forces for the world economy. Utterly different, may I say, from spring 2020 when I was uh, ringing the alarm bells about the prospect of inflation. Let's just look at the latest numbers. Um, here are the numbers for the USA. Uh, there was a period when the quantity of money actually fell. Um, the annual growth rate now is, is almost nothing. Um, the, in the last three months, the quantity of money went sideways. Um, this is the Eurozone. Um, you know, um, again, this surge in 2020, not so extreme as in the USA, but... And then the last few months actually going down, last few months kind of actually falling, three-month annualised line. And then in the UK, much the same as the Eurozone, um, actually going down in the last three months. What does it tell you about the prospect for these economies? It's negative for these economies, both for economic activity and inflation. There's an awful lot more to say. Um, this, this video has gone on long enough now. And um, we will follow these developments in coming months. But um, it's very, although to concede, um, labor markets are still rather tight in most of the major economies. Um, and indeed, demand has been more resilient than might have expected in 2023. The prospect in coming months will be for worsening economic activity. Uh, um, and then in late 2024, I suggest even sharper falls in inflation and a big drop in interest rates. Thank you.